I do remember that patient. I had this question or what sort of things were you thinking about? Because a lot of times if you're working in a clinic together, you're not necessarily working on the same timeline. They may be seeing a patient before you and they may never have kind of the follow-up on what you decided to do. And give feedback constructively. Um, I remember some of the best feedback I got as a fellow was attending saying, you know, you did identify there was a retinal tear in X clock hour, but you missed the retinal tear at this other clock hour. And that's okay. They need to know what they missed. They need to know um, if they can go back and re-examine something. So that's really, really important from the learning perspective. Now, our education is very different. Um, some places and some of the people watching hopefully are still doing retina drawings, but really retina drawings have really decreased in their number and in terms of their complexity. These are the classic drawings with the different colorings and these beautiful shadings. We've moved away from that with fundus photography and kind of the speed of our clinics with electronic medical records. But I do think drawing is really important to maintain exam skills. We've looked at other tricks to improve exam skills, such as hooking up a video to an indirect, but that's not really practical or feasible in a lot of scenarios. So really, I think it's important to make our trainees draw. It's going to lead to better exam skills. It leads to next obvious steps, like what is a differential? And for me, surgically, it's very important for critical surgical decision making. There's a lot of surgical variability. There are surgeons who simply do one procedure for everyone, such as a vitrectomy, or do buckles in certain scenarios based on one factor or a combination of above or pneumatics. There's many different ways to accomplish one goal. But I do think there are certain factors in the exam that are critical to make decisions. And that's really important for trainees to understand. And that's why it's important for them to examine. So when they are out on their own, they are making these decisions. It does not have to be formal. So a lot of times now, our records don't require a drawing. I've even told fellows residents just draw it on a napkin. In fact, when we were fellows, we used to jot things down. And I am no artist, as you can see, and I have some of the worst handwriting you can see. But certain factors were critical and emphasized. Where's the location of the fluid? Where, well, where are the breaks? How many breaks are there? Is there PVR? Is there a vitreous separation from the retina? These things are critical when you start thinking about what sort of decisions you want to go in uh, preoperatively into surgery in terms of planning. Now, I'm going to go through some cases. Other big lessons from the clinic uh, for all uh, of us. Jay, right? if you may allow me just for a second. Um, uh, please, anyone that has any question, you can, uh, you can put them in the Q&As. And if you want to talk, we can we, just raise your hand and at the end of the, discuss, the presentation, you'll be uh, given the chance to do so. Okay, you can carry on. Jay, yeah, back to you. Perfect. So a couple of big lessons from the clinic. First of all, in retina, we inject many things, but not everything does need an injection. The second basic concept, if something is not working in the clinic, stop and think about what is going on. That's a time to reevaluate, consider ancillary testing, kind of maybe even seek help from colleagues to understand what is going on. Review all of your imaging. So if you choose to get imaging, you need to review everything. And both for your exam and imaging, always, always, always check both eyes. So in many scenarios, when we acquire, for example, an OCT or a fundus photograph, we're acquiring pathology in one eye. We may not think that there is pathology in the other eye, but we cannot get lax and miss and not check everything that we acquire in the other eye. So I'm going to show some examples. And I'll, um, this is from Dr. Akersan as one of our residents. This was a case he found. Um, so this is a patient who presented the OCT appearance approved. Here's the problem. When you look at four years later, this patient comes back, you can see a tremendous amount of pathology in both eyes. And in fact, this patient did have a peripapillary CNVM, but they had that in the setting of serpiginous choroiditis. So this was a patient who had serpiginous starting the left eye, no clear signs on the fundus photograph in the right eye, but there was something more going on. It was simply not enough to just inject this patient. And if you look at the imaging, this is the autofluorescence, you can see the drastic change in the left eye from the initial pathology. If you look at the right eye though, that wasn't completely normal to begin with. And you can see these lesions that are progressing over time. So we cannot just simply fall in the trap of saying, okay, you're injecting. And a lot of times I think we turn our brains off and stop following both eyes, really, really look at both eyes critically and stop and think if something does not make sense. This is a similar case in terms of lesson. This is a lady with hypertension and diabetes, pretty sick patient with diffuse retinal hemorrhages in both eyes. This patient had been diagnosed with macular edema in both eyes, had received six injections in each eye in an outside facility, and came in complaining that her visual acuity was not improving. 
here are the OCT appearances in both eyes. So tremendous amount of subretinal fluid with some intraretinal fluid and decreased vision in both eyes. Now, there's a couple of red flags in this case, but the biggest red flag would be this patient's been getting treatment and they're not getting better. This argues against the VEGF responsive process. And in fact, the astute resident, Dr. Fowler, who saw this patient, decided to do a laboratory workup and was concerned to find the patient had a high serum viscosity and ended up having a high protein level with an M spike and monoclonal, excuse me, polyclonal gammopathy. The patient was diagnosed with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and was treated with plasmapheresis. And you can see rather than anti-VEGF, the plasmapheresis made a significant difference in improving the vision at one year in both the right and the left eyes. So again, critical to think not every needs, everything needs injections. And if something is not getting better, to contemplate alternative diagnoses. Finally, this is a case of a patient that I operated on, and these are OCTs of the right and left eye respectively, the right eye in here and the left side of the screen. This patient was two months after a vitrectomy uh, for an RD in the right eye and presented with cystoid macular edema and decreased vision. The patient was actually seen um, by one of my fellows and the fellow saw the patient, quickly looked at both OCTs and said, okay, you have some CME in the right, I'm gonna start a topical non-steroidal. The left eye looks fine, interpreted left eye as normal. Patient then came back to see me a month later. The right eye had improved vision, uh, CME had resolved, but the patient complained of some decreased vision in the left eye. And you can see there's some shallow subretinal fluid in the left eye. And in fact, on exam, the patient had a shallow retinal detachment extending into the macula. So I was curious, so I went back to the OCTs from the month before. And in fact, the central cut showed no fluid, but if you look at all of the cuts, in the inferior most cut, we just see the beginnings of some subretinal fluid that was tracking. So in fact, this patient already had the detachment at post-op one two, but because we didn't go through all the cuts, the fellow didn't choose to go through all the cuts, they simply did a, were focusing on the right eye, just looked at the single cut in the left eye, and didn't look at all the available information on the left. So again, look at every piece of information, make it part of your habit. And that's how you'll avoid missing things like this, because it's nothing worse than missing something that you did pick up, but you just didn't review your imaging appropriately. So I'm going to now talk, so most of the time talking about surgery in the retina OR. Um, I don't know if you want to stop for questions now, or do you want me to keep going? Yeah, I think, I think we have a raised hand uh, over here. Um, uh, I'll allow for, the, for uh, Huawei to ask. Can you? Okay, it seems it's, uh, it's someone who's, uh, who's speaking in Arabic. It's not very clear. I think we can, we, I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, that, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of what you just mentioned about uh, uh, about not missing the the other eye, so so t typically in in in, a, in the setting of a clinic, uh, you mentioned that you would be uh, you, you've tried using those um, live video uh, indirect uh, um, thermoscopy. Yes. And and um, probably having having a tool uh, that's uh, that that allows you uh, to to show exactly what 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 would be the the findings in the other eye would be a very, a very thing that a useful thing that you can, uh, you can uh, work with in, in the clinic. But uh, have you tried? Uh, I mean, uh, basically using those. How do you find the the optus in, in those kind of situation? You want to examine the periphery and and and. Uh, You're talking about an optus photograph or a yes. video kind of setup. A video, uh, and you, do you find that the optus is, is uh, that useful sure. in those kind of situations? So I'll start with the video. I'll tell the the problem with the video is there is not a tremendous market for it. So the the quality of the video is decent, but in terms of I'll tell you honestly, the headsets generally aren't as comfortable as a normal indirect, and I think part of that they probably could be streamlined, but no one's ever filled that niche probably because there's no demand for it. I do think it's really one of the inefficiencies of what we do. A lot of retina teaching is you look, you see something, you switch, you ask the other person to look for it. Yes. They look for a while and they don't see it. And you go back and forth until either they see it or they feel badly enough to lie about it and say they see it. Exactly. Yeah. So I do think that's an unmet need. Um, and I do think if we could develop a low cost way to hook up all the monitors and in teaching institutions, that would be helpful. Wide field photography has changed a lot of things. And I think that Optos is terrific. I really like the Optos, in terms, especially the fluorescein in terms of capturing information. 
The only thing about the opposite doesn't capture everything. So it, it gets up much further than you would expect, but it doesn't get all the way to the periphery. So it's not, a, in my mind, a replacement for a depressed examination, for example. The second thing with the optos, which hopefully will improve as wide field photography gets better, I don't think the color is always, and I think this, I'm not the first person to say it, the color is not always uh, equal to what you would see in real life. So it does tend to fade out certain colors or make other things look more concerning. So it's very, very good and much better than what we had before. I still think a Topcon montage is a better quality picture, but isn't always feasible. So I, again, I think you're right. As the wide field photography gets better though, then we'll be able to improve how we teach people in the clinic. Yeah, I see another question. Uh, someone is asking, do you think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, better if you need to see every patient uh, that uh, your trainee sees, or is it, uh, especially now that you're talking about fellows who are actually managing your clinic, so, so do you feel the need to see them uh, uh, with them in, all the time, or is it, is it something that... That's a great question. I think that I've evolved over time. I think when you first start as an attending, especially post-op patients, so for example, post-operative day one, we would operate on, let's say, Friday or Saturday, um, a lot of people don't necessarily have to come in and they'll have the fellow see the patient. When I started, I would see all of those patients. And, and I think part of that was for me to, to develop those relationships, develop that sense of responsibility for the patient to know I was available. Um, and for me to develop trust with, with people over time. As time has gone on, for example, a post-op day one, I've relaxed that. So I won't always come in if I trust the fellow and the patient and I talk about the plan. But I have a low threshold to come check in. I'm probably more conservative than most people. In terms of the clinic, my own patients, I always try to check them myself. Now, there, there are some patients where it's just imaging, especially now with COVID-19, we're getting more comfortable kind of making decisions without being in person yeah. a yes. lot of the time. Um, so it's forcing me out of, out of my comfort zone. But I would say this, if you're starting as an attending, I would, and I have a point to this about fellows in the future, you, you cannot completely trust anything anyone ever tells you. And that's not a knock against your fellows or residents, but ultimately the responsibility is yours. So especially when you're starting that first couple of years, I would double check everything because you, there's no worse situation than having an, a negative outcome. Uh, and thankfully, the patient I showed had a very good outcome. He had a great visual outcome, actually, in both eyes. But there's nothing worse than having a negative outcome because, you know, the, you, didn't the, see. The, you didn't see the patient. And, and in that case, there was a situation where I was out of town. The patient happened to come in for, he was out of, came from out of town for his post on too, and I just wasn't there. And sometimes you're just not there to see your patients. So you have to have some trust, but I would say low threshold to check those patients. Great. I think we can carry on with, with okay. the rest of it. So I'm going to focus on the OR. So the three things I'm going to talk about are the best ways to learn and teach. And then I'm going to go through some specific case example, surgery videos, if certain specific cases, tips, and how I've kind of managed and learned over time. And the final thing we're going to talk about is handling complications. So as a trainee, you want to show up early. You want to be useful. And you want to read and watch in advance. So professional athletes watch film of what their performance, but you also want to watch film of what you're going to do. So if you are going to go and do your forced membrane peel, you should watch a video of it before you head to the operating room. You need to follow instructions. So part of the trust exercise in retina is generally only one person has their hands inside the eye at a time. So you are the attending's hand. So you need to follow instructions. The attending needs to trust that if they tell you to do something or not do something, that you will do that. Switch when asked, seems obvious it, but for most of us, but you do need, there are sometimes fellows who are resistant to switching. It's not a knock to switch. It's okay to be a little comfortable. At the same time, it's okay if you're uncomfortable and you're operating to either wait for the attending or to ask the attending to switch out. It's okay to kind of fall in that middle ground, but you do need to be a little uncomfortable and push yourself over time. And your attending's job is to guide you through that. The most important point I'll make is you have to take notes. So this is not a passive exercise. You don't just show up to the operating room, operate without attending and come back in a week and start try to remember everything they did. There is nothing more frustrating as an attending than to operate with the fellow. And then a week later, they ask you the same questions they asked you the week before, or they seem surprised when you do something a certain way that you already showed them. So it depends on your scenario. Some people operate with only one attending for their fellowship. I was in a fellowship, we operated 18 attendings and it was a different attending every day sometimes. So it was kind of difficult to take track. So I used to take notes. So taking notes makes the attendings life easier. It reinforces these lessons you'll carry for life. I used to review these the night before operating with the same attending. And the truth is you're more likely to operate with an attending if you know they're, if they know that you put in the time to understand what they do and make their life easier. 
So these are actually, this is a screenshot of some of the tips I made for my first day in the OR with an attending. So basic things, just how they stain, how do they prefer, prefer to remove the instruments, what kind of percentage ma uh, gas they use, um, you know, things that they had told you so that you're not asking those same questions the next week when you operate with them. Now, when we're teaching, the most important thing is to set expectations, right? So again, when I started, I didn't always do this. And I think I, I would just show up and I would be very nice and be very friendly. But I think actually fellows prefer, in a way, if you're a little more firm, and you, you kind of say, okay, these are the things you're going to be doing. Your responsibilities for today are to make sure all the patients have paperwork done. All the patients have X done. I'll take care. So for example, I'll be like, sometimes I'll, I'll say, I'll take care of doing the notes after the case if you take care of making sure the patient's eye is patched and putting them in position. Make sure that the expectations are set. If I know there's a case that I'm going to do and the fellow's not going to do, I tell them in advance. So they're not thinking and sitting there during the case thinking, did I just do something wrong? Was it something that I did that I'm not operating? I try to really set expectations from the beginning. I make my fellows make a shopping list in advance of what they need for each case. And I'll show an example of this. So I force them to think like an attendee it allows them to really have to go through the steps and visualize in order what they're going to do and reinforces this aspect of surgical planning. You have to breathe as the attending, otherwise you end up aging like I have five years in a year because at some point it's going to be frustrating and there is a little bit of repetitiveness to constantly starting with someone new sometimes each year and having to start from scratch. It's the enjoyable part is watching them grow. The not enjoyable part is starting from square one again every year. But breathe and understand to be patient. It is okay to switch. The patient always comes first. But one of the things I really appreciated as when I was a fellow and that I try to do for my trainees is be willing to switch back. So you don't have to, but if you switch a at them and you think it's comfortable to switch back and your efficiency and everything is flowing, switching them back will reinforce to them that if they get switched, A, it does not mean that it's the end of the case for them. And B, it's not something you're doing as a punishment. It's not pejorative. The final thing is give follow-up on post-ops. So hopefully your fellows are able to see the post-ops. Some of us operate at different hospitals or go to different clinics. You want to give follow-up in your post-ops to your fellows to give them, give them one, a sense of, um, of ownership over those cases. And two, they need to know what happened from the things that you decided during surgery. This is an example of a shopping list. I blocked out the names for privacy concerns, but this is a recent one for my excellent fellow, uh, Dr. Ashkenazi where I asked her to send me in advance on Monday all the things she would need for each case. And I actually, and then what I'll do is I'll read that and I'll send back kind of a revision and say, okay, this is what I think we'll use, or even the morning of, I'll tell them. So I think it's really helpful to have them go through this process. So also when they go out as attendings, they know what to ask for because their OR may not have the same setup as the OR they train in. So I'm gonna go through some specific cases. These are cases, some of these I've shown in the past at actually the Vit Buckle meeting a few years ago on teaching fellows, but there's some new ones. There are different lessons. I think the most important lesson I'm going to focus on, I'll talk about this, is it's the most important thing in any surgery is you need to be able to see and visualize. And so for fellows, I think the biggest barrier is they can't see as well when they are operating as when you're operating. And so that puts a ceiling on how much they're able to do. That is also, the, I think, the most common reason for complications during surgery is poor visualization leading to a poor maneuver or some sort of iatrogenic damage. But I'm going to go through some of these cases for fluorocarbons first, it's very important to know how to use it. We know that, for example, in a giant retinal tear, we don't use tacks, we don't use tables to flip the patient. We have an extremely high success rate now using fluorocarbons for these patients. And there's different tricks to using perfluorocarbons. We have to understand that when we use perfluorocarbons and we use it, for example, to drain from a peripheral break, that if you perform a fluid air exchange but do not drain from the break, and that's figure B here, that the fluid just ends up reaccumulating. But when you fill the perfluorocarbon up and do a fluorocarbon exchange, you need to fill up either the PFO to the break, or if you're going to fill up PFO to the aura serrata, the break needs to extend to the aura serrata. This is an example video of just using perfluorocarbon. So this was a case, uh, actually a monocular gentleman with a total RD whose hand motion when he presented, we ended up doing a buckle with the vitrectomy. And so after we completed the vitrectomy, we identified a retinal break that will be supratemporally here. This is in the left eye. And there's that break, we've marked it. And so we decided to use perfluorocarbon in this case. Uh, I, the surgical decision making is very variable. For me in these cases, I like to use perfluorocarbon and avoid a posterior drain. But one of the keys with perfluorocarbon is you need to roll the bubble away from the break in order to maximize drainage. If you notice I'm tilting infranasally to maximize drainage from the suprotemporal break. 
In this case, I choose to fill up the bubble just to the edge of the brake. You're gonna see some of that chronic fluid escaping from the brake as we drain. And then the second critical thing is you want to do a proper fluid air exchange and make sure you remove all the perfluorocarbon because retained perfluorocarbon is a problem. So we go to air and then the key is to drain from that brake and make sure that brake is dry prior to taking down the perfluorocarbon. Once you engage the perfluorocarbon bubble and remove it during a fluid air exchange, you're no longer using its drainage property. So you really need to drain as much as possible from that brake prior to taking down the perfluorocarbon. Finally, when you take the perfluorocarbon down, a couple of critical points, you wanna take it down at the posterior most point, usually the nerve, and then you want to make sure, if you're using a back flush or a soft tip, to have some negative aspiration as you leave the eye, so you do not drip perfluorocarbon, which is a heavy liquid, back in the eye inadvertently. And finally, I do always perform a saline rinse at the end of these cases to make sure the perfluorocarbon is, is, is uh, all removed. So laser was applied here. And this patient actually did very well. This is just the rinse we're showing some VSS is squirted, and then you do a, a removal finally at the end. And you can also vent, so given perfluorocarbon is volatile, you could also vent to evaporate perfluorocarbon. Uh, Jay, now, I, I, perfluor I, I want to ask you about uh, something. So, so um, we know for the step uh, that, that is uh, perfluorosilicon oil exchange, sometimes with, with giant tears. And, and typically it's a, a step that's, that, that you want to do in a, in a very stressful situation. Uh, do you tend sure. to give the, the fellows the chance to do it in a, in a, in a less, uh, let's say, a critical uh, time or, or, or a critical case? Absolutely. So they would be... So that's, that is a terrific point. So one of the points I've made to my fellows is I do not want their first time using perfluorocarbon to be a case like the video I'm going to show now with a large retinectomy or a giant retinal tear because those cases are already stressful. And those cases are more difficult to do a perfluorocon oil or air exchange properly. So what I generally recommend is I actually, and I have this advantage being in a hospital, I'll have them use perfluorocarbon on a case like the one before, where there's a smaller break or just a single break. And instead of making a retinotomy, they get comfortable manipulating perfluorocarbon in the eye so that they're not using it for the first time in a complicated case. And I think that's a great teaching point to help kind of that learning curve. So they're not going into a giant retinal tear and fighting slippage, for example, on the first time they're using PFO. Another advice uh, from, from one of the uh, participants, he says, um, optimize the, for uh, video sharing, probably it would give the, the best quality for the video, your, uh, your, your presentation. Uh, if you can try that from the options of uh, Zoom. Let me just do one thing. Let's just see. I'm just looking for that option quickly. I don't see it unless I'm missing it here. Uh, I'll ask Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed, do you know do you know where where you can reach that option? Because I'm not aware of it as well. Okay, I think we can we can okay. carry on with the presentation. Please. So. This is just another example of using perfluorocarbon. This again, this is a case with a large retinectomy with pro proliferative vitreous retinopathy. Um, and what we're, again, we're going to do is we're going to fill this bubble. We're trying to minimize those fish egg bubbles to minimize subretinal. And then again, tilting away from the retinectomy does two things. It maximizes drainage and avoids trapping that edge under the perfluorocarbon bubble. So tilting superiorly. And you can actually see there's still some retina that was trapped and you can use a soft tip or something similar to unroll that before lasering. But PFO is not magic, and it's not something that you can use in every case. So one of the key things to teach our fellows is you can't just use it and expect it to work. So if there's traction or if it's not flattening the retina as you'd expect, then you need to do something else. So this is a case, large, large tear in a patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy and a chronic detachment. And what you can see and what we're going to find is there was an inferior area that was retinectomized and flattened nicely. But superotemporally, we're going to identify that the retina is still detached superotemporally. And that's what we're assessing here with the soft tip. There's still subretinal fluid. So in fact, in a case like this, you have to extend the retina to be a little further. The perfluorocarbon was taken down. We extended it just a little bit more superotemporally to relieve that traction. And now that area flattens down very nicely. So if the bubble does not stay round, if it ovalizes, if the retina is not flattening beneath the bubble and remains detached, then it's not magically going to fix the problem. So the second thing is you have to depress in the clinic and you have to depress in the operating room. 
And it's critical to depress. This is a case I did with the fellow where there was a superior detachment. The fellow was doing the case I'm observing. They found a superior retinal tear right there with the flap. But then when I went and redepressed at the end of the case, I found an additional tear in attached retina inferiorly. So not to have tunnel vision. If you do find a tear, that's great. That still means you have to look everywhere else for tears. And that's one of the big things we have to teach our fellows is to get good at depressing. And again, like you mentioned, doing this in normal cases and elective cases without peripheral pathology will make them better at depressing in the operative room in cases like this that are detached. Finally, you have to teach them how to troubleshoot when they can't see. This was a patient we did with sickle cell where we're going around and the view is just getting progressively worse and you can see it's getting hazier. And this is the point the fellow is just like, I don't understand why I cannot see. I can't understand. And I say, okay, this is where you remove whatever viewing system you're using indirect or contact lens. Here's the indirect system. You can see the anterior chamber is actually filled with blood. There's been a spontaneous hyphema that's developed mm -hmm. and we just troubleshoot it. We washed out the AC and the view improved. So you always have to kind of think that the fellow has to kind of go through the process of understanding if I cannot see, I've got to stay committed and kind of work from front to back and figure out why that is. I'm going to skip this one. Okay, this is my big point. You can't trust anything you're told when you start as an attending. So this is a perfect example. If a, fish, a fellow signs up a vitreous hemorrhage, it does not mean that it's just a vitreous hemorrhage. So this is a case I did in my first year as an attending was signed up as a vitreous hemorrhage. And I got in and immediately I was like, this does not feel right. There's tons of pigment. There's these sheets of pigment on the retina. The retinal vessels have pigment within them. And this was actually a patient who ended up having metastatic melanoma um, that was supposedly in remission, but had metastasized to the vitreous into the retinal blood vessels. So always, always, always have a degree of suspicion, suspicion when something is signed up for you by a colleague or a trainee that you just need to think about there may be outside the box things that may exist. Second thing is fellows get tired. So fellows are not machines. So if you're operating with a fellow, you need to be aware that they may run into trouble. So this is a patient with a, a macular hole from trauma. This is the fellow doing all of this. So just a wonderful job. And this is not one of my cases, but from a colleague, they induce a vitreous detachment in this young patient in a very, very nice manner, very, very nicely controlled. They did a very meticulous peripheral shave. They stained here using endocyanin green. Now under the contact lens, they're doing great. And this is where you have to recognize the fellow's getting a little tired. The lens is slipping. They've got an edge. You can see the lens view is not great. They're trying to center things. And there's the problem right there. Light pipe hits the retina because the fellow slips. And now you have a traumatic issue. So you need to be able to identify the tremors when the fellow seems like they're breathing harder. These are times it's okay to switch them and give them a break. Or even if you don't switch them, have them come out of the eye and take a minute. Not everything is a fellow's fault. So this is the case I operated with the fellow. I told them to stain with the ICG and I kept telling them, why can't you stain it? And the ICG just won't go down. It keeps floating every time it's injected. Well, it turns out that it was mixed wrong. It was mixed with sterile water instead of saline. And so it won't float and it won't sink in the saline. It kept floating. So the fellow ended up being okay. IOLs, I'm just going to talk about quickly. I talked to my fellows about the most important thing. We know that the best IOLs are in the bag. If we can't get in the bag, then we have other options such as a sulcus lens. And if you can't do that, you have many options for a secondary IOL. That I'm going to briefly review, but there are many different ways to achieve this. But what I tell my fellows is whatever you are most comfortable with is best for your patient. And this is true in many circumstances. You want to learn to have multiple options to adapt. But generally, you, especially if the patient has just one eye, don't be doing something unique that you've never tried before without any help or any preparation in a patient if you are more comfortable with another technique. You know, some tips I tell my fellows, for example, for an anterior chamber lens that can affect their outcome, getting good hemostasis of a tunnel, correctly sizing it, making sure your haptics are along the correct meridian where you measured, measuring correctly to size an ACR well, and then doing things to avoid iris issues, such as making a PI, avoiding tucking the iris and using myocol or some sort of constricting agent to keep the pupil small. And I'm going to skip the example of the ACI well. For, you have many options to do a fixated eye well, for example. So for example, we do a lot of modified Yamanes. I tell my fellows, you're going to think about this. You need to have good congenital coverage. And the most important part is making sure your measurements are correct, that you're measuring 180 degrees apart and that you have a similar angle on both sides to minimize tilt. And then don't break your haptics. So this is an example of a patient 
who had a rescued eye wall. This is a iris sutured lens that had broken. And again, making these measurements with 27 gauge trocars, we measured with the toric marker 180 degrees apart. And then displacing the conjunctiva, we have good coverage here, making sure those trocars that we use for the modified technique are 180 degrees apart. And if you can make those measurements correctly, you're gonna see this is very, very, very smooth otherwise. We cleaned up the residual capsule here, and then we retrieved the IOL after making sure the vitrectomy was complete. And you can see just the handoffs here. Beautiful job done by the fellow. Making sure to remove the cannula so you don't break the haptic. And then doing the same on the other side, we use a little flange with some cautery so that the haptic doesn't slip. And this is a very, very nice technique that many of you may be familiar with or are doing a more traditional technique with needles rather than trocars. And this is the patient post op day one, 2025. I do a lot of sutured lenses. So this goes back to my point about pre-planning for my fellows. I think it's very, very important to be meticulous and to pre-plan. The downsides of a technique like this have to be taken into account. So I, the biggest issue my former fellows run into is they don't have enough conjunctiva. So they get into problems with suture erosion. Um, and so just an example for those not familiar with this technique, this is from one of my uh, colleagues, good friend, Dr. Ali Khan here in the US. We make conjunctival pyridomies, temporally and nasally, typically sitting superiorly. We get good hemostasis. We measure 180 degrees apart. And then we generally make these marks three millimeters back from the limbus and five millimeters apart. And those are gonna be the exit points for our suture. We use Gore-Tex suture, which was a suture first described in the vascular surgery literature that's very, very durable. We use that in place of proline. This is a case that needed a phragmatome for a dropped lens. We make a corneal wound. This is an acrios lens. It's a four point lens made by Bausch and Loam. And then we thread this lens. And this is a case where it's very, very important to be meticulous. The setup and the closure of these cases usually takes longer than the threading when you're done. And then we sequentially thread each of these sutures in and out of the ports. And again, keeping an eye on which order you're in will tie into one of my later points about efficiency. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward. So the biggest issue is even in our hands, we get into problems. This was an attending case, and I'm going to lead this into my discussion of complications for the last five minutes. This was a membrane peel uh, from a friend of uh, mine who shared where the attending is actually doing the peel. And you're going to see the patient is going to cough right when the attending goes to pinch the ILM. And there's the cough. And so bad things can happen. And so the key is, what do you do when a bad thing happens, right? We can be depressed and we can sink in that and wallow in that, but we need to be prepared to get back and figure out how to get better from it. Complications happen to all of us. And I really divide it in my head into three categories. There's completely unavoidable complications. That patient coughing, anything is avoidable to an extent, but that is more on the unavoidable spectrum. Avoidable with best practices would be if with better technique, you could have avoided it. And then there's complete error, for example, that light pipe running into the retina should not have happened. And our job is to balance as surgeons, not letting complications dictate our behavior, but also not becoming cavalier. So I would advise this stepwise approach, new attending, fellow, anybody. The first thing is deciding, does a complication need immediate action? If yes, that's your first priority. There's an infusion in the supracoidal space. You've got a choroidal bleed from striking the choroid. That needs to be addressed as soon as possible because if it is not controlled, it will affect the outcome of the surgery. If it's not immediate or once you have something controlled, then I suggest just taking a deep breath and thinking for a minute. It's okay to come out of the eye, think about what your plan is gonna be. Do you need to change the surgical plan? For example, if the fellow struck the lens, do you need to now perform a lensectomy? Is this complication visually significant or not? And can you do something to address that? And the biggest thing is review your case goals and finish the case Save fault assignment analysis for later. I don't believe the right time to sit and analyze why something happened is during the surgery. It is later. And so there's times to move like a cheetah and there's times to move like a turtle. What are the priorities during any of our surgeries? The biggest priority is first do no harm, right? So if you're at a point during surgery, and this is a common way people get into complications, where you're not making progress and you're doing more harm than good, then you need to move on to the next step or, finish this, or just finish the surgery. We do want to accomplish the goals of surgery and that we want to be efficient. It's more important to accomplish the goals than be efficient. But 
being efficient will avoid harm and complications and accomplish goals. But just, I always teach my fellows, speed is not a replacement for accomplishing your goals. So going through this priority list in your head is really, really important, especially if you encounter a complication. So how do I avoid complications? This is a silly lesson, but I remember this from fellowship. The most important thing is do not operate on the wrong eye. That is just that uh, you'll hear horror stories. Of this you just do not operate on the wrong eye. Avoid infection by prepping and draping appropriately. And then I go back to the idea of the view. So for fellows and attendings, make sure your view is preserved. So lubricate the cornea during a buckle. Don't inadvertently scrape or strike the cornea if you're doing a buckle with the subsequent vitrectomy. Avoid prolonging periods of high intraocular pressure because that may lead to corneal edema. For the anterior chamber, you may get hyphema if you have hypotony. So avoiding hypotony for a lens, not touching the lens in a crystalline lens situation. For the vitreous, meticulous hemostasis. My fellows need to know where the diathermy and IOP buttons are on the foot pedal at all times when they operate with me. You need to have quick access to these things in cases where you may run into hemostasis issues. So for peeling, I'm going to play this video while I talk. I get this question, fellows, how do I avoid problems with peeling? So I tell them the most important thing is good visualization with lighting. Most fellows, when they start, stay too far away from the retina, so they can't see well enough to peel. They need to actually be closer. But they're scared about coming too close because they don't want to strike the retina. So it's kind of finding that sweet spot. You want to follow the forces on the retina to peel in one sheet. Now, this will come up as a surgeon here starts to peel. And lift up slightly so you avoid dragging the instrument across the retinal surface and work peripherally. In the end, being more efficient with your peel and understanding these forces will lead to shorter surgeries. And there's less risk of complications like that patient coughing or moving while you're peeling. I also would suggest the more awake, if you're not operating under general, if you're operating under uh, sedation, the more awake your patient is during a peel, the better. Patients who are asleep or snoring or moving tend to be more, uh, tend to have more of these sudden movements that can lead to problems. This is an example of re-grasping and extending that peel nicely and then restaining. Now, if you do have a complication, what do you do once you finish the case? Your biggest responsibility first is to finish that case and then be honest with the patient. But I would consider if the patient's coming at anesthesia to really save major details for the family or for the next day. I would do a quick summary. I would be honest about the visual prognosis. And you really need to support this patient in the post-op period. Be available and fight your ego. Your ego is going to make it painful for you to see that patient. You need to see that patient as much as possible. That is the opposite of what your ego wants you to do. This isn't about your ego. This isn't about your identity as a surgeon. This is about the patient having access to you in a tough situation. You also have to remember, maybe that's your first case of the day and you have four other cases. You need to prepare for those other cases. So I would suggest if you have a bad case, walk out of the operating room, take a deep breath, drink some water, eat something, walk away for a few minutes, decompress, and then come back. When you get home, the first thing you shouldn't do is think about the case. I would suggest you decompress mentally a little bit. And then you need to have video. I would say if you recording your cases is the most important thing you can do to learn review your cases, and then don't forget about your fellow. So let's say your fellow was the one who had the complication. You have to put yourself in their shoes, how badly they're feeling. Give them time to process. I would save the intellectual part for later. Consider not having them operate in the very next case, not as a punishment, but to give them a little bit of a break, but then get them back on the horse and acknowledge. And what I tell my fellows if there's a problem is, ultimately, this is my responsibility, not yours. So your job is you're here to learn and to avoid these problems in the future, but ultimately what happened was my responsibility and not yours. And that really helps the fellows kind of keep moving on. So I'll just end with this. This is a quote. Atul Gawande, who's an author here in the U.S., wrote a great book called Complications. He's a general surgeon. And it's just about the idea that we can't achieve perfection, but we can aim for it. So I'll end there, and then we can have discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. Um, it's such a... Um, Ex expansive uh, uh, look at, at the way we, we do surgery and, and how we are involved with our fellows in, in, each, uh, in each case and in each interaction. And I think it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's, it's an inviting subject for, for discussion. So I would uh, rather that anyone that has any question to raise their hands, we'll, we'll have them um, answer the questions. I, I, would, I do have some questions to probably begin the, the discussion. So sure. So you so you said you said earlier that um, that you would yeah, I mean you talked to, to you, at the stage of consenting the patient. Now uh, you would you would be inclined to uh, to discuss the, the the general risk of any surgery. But given that you are working with a fellow, um, do you do you start on, on like talking about special um, 
do, do you address them more carefully or, or you try to stress on them when you're talking to, to the patient because you know that you're working with a fellow? Probably there's a, a higher, higher chance of getting a complication. Is it something that you, uh, that you discuss in terms of in the consent? And then we'll talk later about how you, you introduce. That's a great, you, uh, that's a great question. I, so I do, disclosure, I do probably 95% of my cases with a fellow. So it's rare that I operate alone. Um, and even if I'm operating, quote unquote, as the surgeon, I usually have an assistant in the room or someone watching. I do not change my consent because I have the humility to understand that those complications can happen whether or not I have a fellow. So I still go through similar things. I talk about uh, bleeding. I talk about infection. I talk about with detachments about cataracts or the possible necessity to remove, if we're doing a vitrectomy, remove the cataract. I talk about redetachment. Um, I don't necessarily change that discussion if I have a fellow. I have had patients ask me, for example, hey, will you have a trainee or can I request a retainee not be involved? And I generally say that I work at a teaching hospital. There is always someone in training with me. We operate together as a team and everything we do together is as a team. But ultimately, I am there every step of the way and I'm responsible. And I would say for 99.9% .9 of my patients, that is sufficient. For the one or two patients I've encountered who have still been very assistant that a fellow not operate, I've respected those wishes, uh, but I have told them that unless they specifically request it, I still would like a fellow to assist me. Uh, and I think that none of them ever said no, because I do think having an assistant can improve outcomes in certain situations. So hopefully that helps answer a little bit of the question. Yeah, I, I have a question from the audience as well. Uh, the question says, what do you do uh, to discuss complications that, that's induced by the fellow and to make them understand and accept them. Uh, some of them might resist uh, to listen. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'll, first of all, I'll say I've been very grateful that most fellows are reasonable people, just like most surgeons, and they are willing to accept the fact that they're human and in fact go the other way, where they're too critical of themselves. Every once in a while, you will meet somebody who simply does not accept that they are the problem. And I think that this is where you have to sort of change your approach depending on the fellow. Generally, I'm more supportive saying, no, this is my responsibility. I don't reinforce the complications on them. I don't want to make them feel badly. Someone who's more resistant, I've taken a more direct approach and sat down with them and talked about them. And for example, I had, this is a while ago, I had a fellow once tell me, you know, who created an atrogenic break and detachment was not a big deal, but they insisted it was not their fault. Um, and I had to have sit down afterward and have a discussion and be like, look, it's okay. That's your fault. You need to accept this. I just think you just need to be more direct with certain people. And I think the biggest thing is even when you're direct with them is not to make it personal. It's not a personal attack or a criticism. This is just something about helping them become a better surgeon. And so it's just hard to find that constructive medium when you give negative feedback. Uh, one of my friends taught me the sandwich method is you always say one nice thing, then the bad <laughs> thing you have to say, and then another nice thing. And that usually works pretty well. Yeah, I think it's, it's a general uh, advice in life uh, yeah. overall. <laughs> no, so, one, I mean, uh, no one wants to hear anything negative. So I think it's just yeah. about putting it in that nice sandwich. Yeah. I think this is a question from one of the residents, I assume. Uh, he says, how do you balance between uh, residents and fellows teaching if you have both in That's, the same location? That's a very good question. I think that depends on two things. One, it depends on the priorities of your institutes and the responsibilities assigned to each. So every institute is a little different in terms of the responsibilities that residents take versus fellows. When I'm in the operating room, my priorities in order are the patient and then the fellow and then the resident and then any students who are in the room. I kind of work down that line. So if a case is going well, for example, I rarely have both a fellow and resident, but if I did, that might be a situation I have. I let the fellow or resident both sit at the scopes and I watch on the screen. Or if it's a very good resident, even the fellow may supervise the resident while I stand there and watch the screen. And if it's a very different, I might even have a student sit at the side scope so they can watch because the view through the scope is always better than the screen. But then if something's not going well or I need to teach the fellow something, my priorities shift. I may spend some time where I don't talk to the student. And in, if I have a resident, I may not talk to the resident much as the fellow. For me, the fellow is the most important in that scenario because they are the one who's closest to what I'm doing as my job. So I need to make sure they're ready. Um, so again, that may vary depending on the responsibilities, but that's kind of my hierarchy for teaching in the operating room. I think this, this takes us to the other question. Uh, um, there's a question about, do you scrub in each case with the fellow? So if, 
basically you have the fellow alone. Do you, do you scrub or do, do they leave them and just watch? I always scrub. Uh, I doesn't mean that I, I, I rarely run, for example, two operating rooms. So our, our policy is generally to have one room. Um, I've had fellows start things and then I'll come in and scrub with them. So I'll have them, for example, if we're doing a buckle vitrectomy, place the buckle or start the vitrectomy and they'll join. But I would, the only reason I would not scrub is if I have some other sort of patient conflict, I'm seeing a different patient, I'm signing up another patient and coming. If I'm physically there, I usually scrub in. Um, there have been instances where, again, I'll, I won't, I'll watch on the screen, but I'm generally scrubbed in so I'm ready to help if needed. So I'm available. Um, I think that varies person to person. For me, I, I like to think the fellow can, even if they're operating alone, that I'm available to help them. Uh, there's another, another question about how would you introduce your fellow to a highly skillful, skilled sure. or a, a, a complicated maneuver like island peeling. Uh, this would take me to, to a, another thing, was, which is um, so uh, when, when, you're, uh, when, when you're training a fellow, you, you typically have in your mind like a benchmark where basically a fellow should be able to probably put, put in the trockers, uh, do some core vitrectomy at a certain stage of his fellowship. Basically, I think we run, we run the same system two years, uh, sure. both of us, but uh, in, in, in the States and, and in Kekish. But uh, um, if, if a fellow is coming into the fellowship where you feel that he's got um, an, a, an advantage in terms of the, his experience or probably just the skills that he has, in here, uh, do you, uh, uh, do you ex extend the, 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 the parts of the surgery that you t typically would give him? Yeah, so I, 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 I had both experiences with attendings. I had some attendings who, depending on the time of the year, they had kind of a mental idea of what the fellow should be doing, and they kind of kept it structured. So beginning of the year, you should be doing a vitrectomy, and by this month, you'll be doing a peel. And, and then I had other attendings who it basically was fellow to fellow, and it depended on how comfortable they were. So for me, it completely depends on where the fellow is. So in my mind, I think basic things are placing ports, closing wounds, then it's can you do a core vitrectomy, an oil removal, a fluid air exchange? From there, it's like doing laser. And then I view peeling as something that's a little further down the line because it requires good visualization and good dexterity. And then I just assess the fellow. I had fellows who've been in the first or two months of fellowship who are excellent, who can go, and I'll let them go. I don't block them just because they're early in their fellowship. And I have fellows who are senior fellows who need some more touch-up, even though I may push them or try to get them more comfortable with those things before they graduate. For ILM peeling, I think the first thing is they need to be able to see. So I like to peel, for example, ILM with a contact lens directly on the corneal surface rather than an indirect lens. So I, they need to be able to demonstrate that they can go in with the instruments, get a good view of the retina, get everything in focus with stable hands, and just be able to even put their forceps in, manipulate them without engaging the retinal surface. If they can do that, then I may start peeling. I think I usually pinch and peel for my ILM peels. So generally what I would do is I, um, if that's a, I will sometimes initiate a flap for them, flip mm -hmm. it over, get it started, and then I'll have them just finish the flap. Or I'll peel most of it, or I'll peel around a macular hole, for example, or I'll leave a flap around that. So it's not critical to the procedure, but they can at least get comfortable manipulating it. And I think things like that, giving them steps to work on, just gets them comfortable. For me, I felt as if all the hardest things sometimes was just initiating a flap. Once the flap is initiated, then they can get comfortable with the manipulation. Um, another question about what, the, what are the most common mistakes that you find your fellows uh, do? That's from uh, Louis, who's a yeah. uh, mentee of mine, good friend. So oh, okay. I, I think the, most, the number one most common mistake fellows make is they assume that there's two, two mistakes. Number one is they don't understand going into surgery what is going on. So they, what I mean by that is what are the goals of the surgery? I think that that's one of the first things to think about. From a, from a surgical perspective, I think the most common mistakes fellows make is they simply don't see well enough during the surgery. Their hands are too tight sometimes, they're gripping the instruments tightly. So when they move around the eye during a vitrectomy, the things don't move smoothly, they cause striae, they cause torquing, and that's very normal. We all did that when we started. Once you get comfortable moving smoothly around the eye, you realize that you don't really have to make extreme movements to reach gel. When you're moving through a port, it's more about reaching through the port than pushing the port to where you go. And that ties into visualization. If you get corneal striae, you're torquing the eye and you're getting kind of an oblique view, then you won't be able to see as well and do as much as you're attending. So I think that's the most common thing is just not getting a good view because of the way they move the instruments within the ports. 
Okay, and um, I do have another question here. So uh, one of our residents, Rakan, is asking, do you offer a feedback for your resident fellows after each uh, rotation? I assume you guys have like I do. A one or two month rotation where, where at the right. end of the rotation you, you so have So I have, I have seven week, I have seven week blocks with residents and I have uh, three month, no, six week rotations with the fellows. I always do that. So towards the end of the rotation, we usually have a day and I'll just say at the end, we'll get some food or we'll sit down. And I'll just go through things and tell them the things they did well, anything they need to work on. Um, I actually try to do that at the end of long award days. If we have six or seven cases together, I'll kind of tell them the things they did well, the things I thought they need to work on. And again, most fellows tend to be self-critical. So they're mostly thinking about the things they didn't do well. So I'm kind of reinforcing the things they did do well that I was impressed or happy with. I do have a question. So, so we have a lot of uh, the company reps coming into the OR sometimes to, to show some of the, their machines or, or their instruments. Uh, do you find dealing with them in, in the setting of the OR uh, useful? Do you, do you, want, do you get to like, uh, link between them and your, your fellows, probably have them have a discussion or are you like uh, skeptical of the whole situation of them being there? So I think there's benefits. So for example, when I was a fellow, we used mostly Alcon equipment, but um, Bausch and Lomb and Dork are the two other major manufacturers for vitrectomy machines in the United States. And both those companies brought in the machines for a week um, during our fellowship. And in one hand, it was challenging because you're learning as a fellow, but you have to learn to use a new machine. But now it's very helpful. And I look back at that fondly because at least they made me feel comfortable with those machines so I can talk about them a little bit intelligently. And I do think also it's helpful for relationships to have those people. Now, they just can't be a distraction, right? Or if I have a fellow who I really want to work on some surgeries with, I don't necessarily want to introduce another variable of using a new machine with them and making their life even harder. So those are, they, the rep can't be a distraction. And then the machine can't take away, or if they're demoing something, can't take away from the learning. But otherwise, I think it is helpful to have them. I think it's just important to frame it in context that they're generally there to market a product or a company. Uh, but I think there is value in forming those relationships and in getting to use some of that equipment that maybe you don't get exposed to otherwise for the fellow. This takes me to, uh, to another subject. Now that we're, we're going more into the 3D uh, viewing system, uh, it's, it's getting uh, you know, a lot of uh, publicity these days. And we have, we have uh, actually a couple of our, in our institution. And I find myself wanting to do more as an attending. I find myself in this dilemma to, to whether to to, you know, because you, typically you can't change the setting within the case if you want to take over that you change it the, the, to the 3D. And I find myself pushing my fellows into doing more 3Ds because of mm -hmm. my interest, my self-interest in doing them. And, and I'm not sure. I mean, it's, if you're thinking of, of it as, as the future, if, 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 if let's say, quote unquote, this is the case, uh, probably it's, 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 it's a good chance to give them a heads, I, I mean, a, 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 a chance to start early into this kind of uh, assistance. What, what do you think? What's your take on that? I think that if you are comfortable as the attending doing it, then you should let, then I think it's, it's useful to do it. We don't have 3D capabilities here, but my guess is, uneducated guess is going to be prevalent as they go through their careers. So I would say that that's reasonable. I think if you're comfortable with that setting, then I think making them use it, even if they don't use it in other attending settings is important. And uh, ultimately, I think the first thing, again, the goal, the first priority is the patient, right? So if, for example, for me, I wanna use the equipment that I'm familiar with. I use my own foot pedal settings, for example, rather than the foot pedal settings maybe the fellow prefers, because if we switch and I need to fix something that's bad, I don't wanna be figuring out what the settings are. <laughs> so that ties into the patient having the best outcome. So I would say that's reasonable, and that's probably what I would do in your setting as well. Uh, I think we have another question from Hamid Basil. It says, do you give trainees stepwise training or you allow them to proceed until they face difficulties in proceeding and notice uh, that they, have, they will start to have complications? I think, I think yeah. the question probably w w where, you're, where you're seeing the fellow having difficulty and then you, do you like give them the How chance much you to push, go? Yeah. How much you push them? The that is yeah. the million dollar question. The best attendings we've had who trained us, they knew... They had that spider sense. They knew when something was about to happen and then they switched. And I think what's happened over time, I developed a little bit of a spider sense to pull back a little earlier. And I think we all go through that when we're new attendings because you do want to push people, but not to the point that something bad happens. So if I had an answer for that, 
um, we would all be, it'd be great. I, I, I think you, it, it's finding that balance. The only person who knows is you. So for me, if I can't see, then we're going to switch, right? So if I'm not seeing well what's going on, that's the most likely reason I'm going to switch because then I don't know if they're getting close to a complication, right? So if I can see what's going on and I'm comfortable, then you can push through. But if it's anything, for example, hemostasis and they're not getting adequate hemostasis rapidly enough, then we may quickly switch. Um, because, and it's not, again, I think the key is to switch back as you get things stable and you switch back and let them take over again. A question from Filipina Vas is, is it's, it's a comment actually. Uh, I also try to get the scope, the pedals, the patient's head in the ideal uh, position before starting the case. Um, do you tape the, the head of the patient? I do. Going to not everyone uh, here does. Some people like to not tape and move the head. I always tape because I'm afraid of them sitting up. Um, I agree with that. And the other comment I would add on that is if you're training someone who's not the same size as you, which is most of us have someone who's either bigger or smaller than us. The one thing that's killed me and I still have to remind myself to do it is when we're switching back and forth, I don't always, I'm not so meticulous about changing the chair height and the scope height. And at the end of the day, my neck or back is really hurting me. Um, so just be aware if you're switching back and forth to adjust those things. I usually set the height of the fellows operating to the height the fellow prefers. And then I adjust myself to that height. But then if you're switching, you should adjust things to where you're comfortable. So the, the, uh, another question of Dr. Saad Wahid, he says, do you think going over surgical videos of, uh, done by the fellow or the resident is useful? Like, like you, a commentary of, over a lot of playback of the video. Uh, do you tend to record? I think all it's super helpful, cases? especially if something didn't go, especially if something didn't go smoothly. I think it's really important to look at that together and see what happened. And do you record all um, cases? All, all, all I try to. I try to. One of the jobs I give my fellows setting expectations, I tell them one of their jobs is to record every case. And at the end of the day, we go through the cases. And if it was boring and nothing happened, then we delete the video. But at least to record it, because you never can never predict when something is going to happen that's unexpected. <laughs> so it's important to kind of keep the tape rolling. But then to avoid clutter, we'll kind of, at the end of the day, review and decide what we want to keep and not. Okay. I think uh, I, someone is, is placing a personal question. I think maybe he's a fellow in a, in a self-doubt uh, situation. He says, is there where there are steps in the start of your practice that you realized were a bit challenge to you personally, although they might be seen uh, to be performed uh, during, you did them well during your training. How do you do, do sure. that? So I will tell you this. I felt like I had a very busy surgical fellowship and I learned a tremendous amount. I still feel I learned more operating the first year I was out than mm. during my fellowship. And I think many of us feel that way. I see you nodding. I, I think that there's nothing you just see that there's just different things you learn about moving the eye. So I'm trying to think of something specific. I think, for example, I'll actually say the opposite. I feel like peeling, for example, got easier for me when I think subconsciously I knew that if I didn't do it, nobody was going to do it. So there's no one who's going to rescue me. So I had to do it. Um, but I think if you're having difficulty with something, I think it's okay to go back to your mentors from fellowship. I've gone back to people. You have to have trusted people, friends or mentors to go back. Having the video is helpful to look at what you're doing. And that's probably the most useful way to kind of overcome any barriers you're having when you start. So, uh, and another question, do you, ha did you have to go to your mentor that ask you, I mean, after you, 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 I think this is, I have this a bunch. is definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely a very, I think valuable you can, you, you need a, you need a brain trust. You need a couple of people that you really trust that you can go to, that you can text, you can email, you can call. Uh, it's really important to have that support because it's doing retinal surgery is not easy and having outcomes of retinal surgery is not easy. And I think it's not just for the, for, for the surgical uh, uh, tips. It's, it's also for them, for the emotional support that you get from, from knowing that you know complications can happen, There's people who are going through this like you would would also uh, raise your uh, your 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 spirits. Uh, got time I, I, for maybe I, one more question. I got to run. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thanks, though, for your time. Okay. No, of course. Uh, um, do you believe that the time of the OR uh, are prized for good work in the clinic, <laughs> or is it a punish? Oh, or as a punishment for laziness and poor <laughs> this is the That's such a good day. question. I love that question. <laughs> you know, I, 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 what I've tried to push myself to be better at is what I wrote on that slide. That's why I wrote it. You need to set expectations, right? So I think many of us have this implicit 
almost passive, it's almost passive aggressive a little bit to be like, well, you didn't really do it. So I'm not going to let you operate as much. We don't actually vocalize it that way. So if you really have somebody who's not doing their things, then I've, I've had this conversation, thankfully only once where I've just been like, look, if you want to operate and take care of these patients, you need to work everywhere. You're not going to be able to do as much in the operating room if I can't trust you to do your work in other places because being meticulous in the clinic is a reflection of your meticulousness, is not just as a clinician, but as a surgeon. So as painful as it is to have that conversation openly, I think you just need to set expectations for someone who's not pulling their weight. I do believe that you, it's not okay for people to be lazy in other parts and just expect to operate. I just think what thing I push myself to do and we all have to try to do is to tell people that. You gotta be open about that and blunt about that. Uh, and give people a chance to correct their behavior. And then if they don't, then you have every reason to kind of be like, look, you just aren't operating today. I, I mean, I had to tell a fellow, there's the only time I'd be like, you're just not going to come scrub with me if you don't do basic responsibilities. Um, and then you know what? It happened after that because we had an understanding and that person did it. It feels painful to have to tell someone that that should be understood. But I think that, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. I like that question a lot. Uh, I, I think uh, our fellows are doing a great job. Uh, I mean, this, 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 I'm sure is a situation in, 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 in your, in, uh, in Baskin Palma as well. Uh, I think they're, uh, they sometimes push themselves into, into a very stressful situation. And I think probably it's, it's the other direction where we actually need to give them the support and let them uh, right. relax, feel that, that they're, that you're with them in this situation. You're not someone that's, that's criticizing them and on top of the, them being in a very daunting situation operating in, in a retina case. So um, I think by this, we, uh, we conclude our session. Thank, I, thank I know you again, you, everyone, for coming. Are, and, uh, <laughs> and I think be you, safe, you, you everyone. <laughs> and uh, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we'll uh, see you again in another meeting. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.